Hello, and welcome to the English with Colin podcast, a podcast for English language learners. My name's Colin. I'm an English teacher in Tokyo. And if you're looking to improve your English skills and gain more confidence in your ability to communicate in English, you've come to the right place. In these episodes, I'll provide you with short conversations in English that cover a range of topics, from everyday situations to more specialized subjects. These conversations are designed to help you practice your listening skills and pick up new vocabulary and grammar along the way. Regular listening practice is key to improving your English, and I hope this podcast will become a valuable resource for you on your language learning journey. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation. And remember, the more you listen, the more you'll learn. This is episode 37, and today's topic is language barrier. Do you really need to know Japanese to live in Japan? Hello, Sue. Hey. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm very well. Um, this, I think, follows on nicely from our episodes on culture shock. Um, but it's a big question. It's a question that I get asked uh, from people visiting is, do you really need to know Japanese to live in Japan? Um, what would you say? I would say it depends. Um, it depends, yes. yes. Because for some coming to live in Japan, that knowing the language and a good level of language mm. is an absolute most, right? Right. They need, they need the language ability. Uh, for me, for example, um, I did not need any Japanese to come. That's right. You came here, you were doing your PhD, which was all in English. It was all in English. Although I had, you know, uh, Japanese uh, students with me and my professors are Japanese, they, they all spoke incredible English. Mm -hmm. So my whole experience doing my PhD was English. And after that, I started teaching at a, an American university. So mm -hmm. again, that's all English. It's still my second language. True. You know, I, I there's an effort there. Yeah. Uh, but and I think the Japanese I have is 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 more like daily life, mm -hmm. but not necessarily like a work um, vocabulary, like working with people. Yeah, I think there there is a big difference between. The Japanese that you need to know to get by in daily life. So, you know, the, the language you need if you want to go to the bank or you want to go to the post office or you want to go to a restaurant or a cafe or whatever. That is daily kind of essential Japanese there. If you're working and, and you need to use Japanese in work, you, that's a different type of Japanese that you need to learn. You start to need to understand about um, formality, formal language. Um, and reading and writing becomes much more important because you're dealing with emails or you're dealing with documents. Um, how to speak on the telephone, how to speak with uh, a client or a customer. Um, it's a very, very different type of Japanese that you need to, to learn. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with your answer. It definitely depends. And, um, I know a lot of people who, you know, they work for a Western company, um, and they live in, you know, central Tokyo and they don't need to use Japanese in their work. And outside of work, they don't really uh, connect with Japanese culture. You know, they live in a, in central Tokyo, which, you know, can be very international. Um, and yeah, they, occasionally they'll need to, to do something in Japanese, but generally they, they don't need to. Um, I think it's important to explain the difference between maybe the city and the countryside. It will be very different, yes. Yeah. So my first experience of living in Japan was in the 
countryside in Niigata, uh, which is out on the Sea of Japan side of, of Japan. And there were very few people who, very few Japanese people who could speak English. Um, I worked at a junior high school and basically the only people at the junior high school who could speak English were the English teachers. Um, and in the community, in the local community, there were very few people who could speak English in, in any kind of conversation, at any kind of conversation level. Um, so that gave me more opportunities to hear Japanese and also use Japanese. And also it was, it was very easy for me to see the benefit of studying. So I would, you know, study every day. I was a very good student when I arrived. I would study every day. And usually what I studied during the day, I could use later that day or the next day. Like immediately the language that I was learning, I could use in real life with people around me. I think that's something you told me once, uh, that you learn something and then you start hearing it. Yeah. So before you you learned it, it, it do, you don't catch it, you don't hear it, yeah. it's, you don't perceive it, you know? Yeah. And once you, you're aware of it, it's everywhere. Yeah, no, it was, a, I remember that moment very clearly. Um, I can't remember this specific grammar point or maybe vocabulary, but when you when you start learning a language, you learn the basics and the basics are the words, phrases that get used most frequently. And yet every one of these bits of vocabulary, bits of grammar, whatever, when you learn one of these, you've got this very, very valuable um, piece of knowledge and you just hear it everywhere suddenly. So that was very rewarding. It was an immediate reward. And I think one of the difficulties with language learning is you don't get the immediate reward. Mm -hmm. Like you've got to study language for years and years and then you get the reward. Typically, you know, people who study language at school, they study for years and years. They don't feel any reward um, until maybe years later they go traveling, for example. Uh, for me, I was learning Japanese in Japan and day to day, I was getting that reward. I was getting this kind of positive uh, reward every day. And that helped with my motivation. You know, I was like, okay, well, what's what's the next chapter going to teach me? And, you know, I could start to sort of um, decode uh, what I was hearing every it's, day. It's like games. It's unlocking the next level. It is. Yeah, no, it's, it's very... It's very much like a video game. It's it's collecting these new skills, these new tools. Um, yeah, definitely a, a comparison can be made with uh, with video games. Um, and again, just living in the countryside, you get a much more, I would say, a much more immersive experience um, because you're you're in a community. And you're seeing, the, you know, the same people, you know, regularly. Um, and yeah, aspects of the, the culture, the tradition, uh, even things like the seasons and the, the, the nature and all, you know, it's a much, much kind of deeper experience, I would say, uh, than the city. Because the city is, it's big buildings, it's concrete, it's chains, chain stores, um, busy people in suits running around. It's a very, very different experience to the kind of things I was able to do, like hand plant rice, you know, with uh, with my students, you know, my fifth grade students every year, they would go out and they'd have a, a rice field mm -hmm. that was given to them to sort of practice with and, and learn about their culture. And yeah, being, you know, knee deep in in mud 
uh, hand planting rice um, as all these elementary school kids are falling over, covering themselves in mud. Um, yeah, you don't get those experiences uh, in the city. Um, so yeah, in the city, there's going to be more people who speak English. And also maybe because of tourism, mm. uh, a lot of people come to the cities and uh, people will, well, locals will be uh, more used to seeing foreigners mm -hmm. and maybe not necessarily the language, but maybe they know attitudes and what they would like uh, and what needs to be done. Um, so yes, so you can get away with not uh, speaking a lot of Japanese, but mm. in the countryside, they will, yeah, it's another type of interactions. Yeah, I mean, I think I I always felt like you're in the countryside, you're very much in their country. Like you've come to where they live. There's no expectation that they should be able to speak your language. No, no, it's, um, it's different from the cities. Yeah. Uh, in the city, you kind of, because of tourism, you expect there to be a little bit of an international mm. group, right? Yeah. Um, but no, in the countryside, no. I think also in, in the cities, um, services are more available in English. Mm -hmm. So things like medical facilities, medical services. So if you need to see a doctor, there are places where um, you can find an English speaking doctor or a dentist. Uh, if you want your haircut and you want to have a hairdresser who speaks English, um, you can find that. Um, also, if you go to the city office, you have something you need to do. There are, especially maybe in, in the bigger cities, they will have staff who will be able to kind of talk you through um, the procedures, which can be complicated. Um, and we've had a lot of help from people at, at the city office um, getting through our, our documents. Um, so yeah, it's to get back to our, our main question, it certainly depends. Um, and there's a big difference between the city and the countryside. Um, anybody who's here long term, um, I think I mentioned it before, but consistency. Consistency, understanding that you're not going to be fluent in a few months, but keeping going. Just find a routine, find a rhythm that you can maintain and yeah, maybe in three months, you don't make much progress, but in six months, a year, two years, five years, you know, you can make a lot of progress, but it's these small steps um, you need to keep keep going with. Um, and yeah, what, what do you think about that kind of having a, a rhythm to your your studying? It's completely necessary. Um, as you said, it's it's taking little steps, mm -hmm. and then when you look back, all you know, you can see the distance all those steps took you to. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see from where you came and where you are, mm -hmm. and that's quite satisfying. Um, and then again, your life is a little bit easier mm -hmm. um, because little things that were difficult to do now, you know, you don't think about them twice. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's automatic. It is, you don't need to think about it. So yeah, um, just consistency and patience. And you can, you can get quite far with that. Yeah, I think the big issue that I've always had with my language study is I have good periods and bad periods. So good periods where maybe I've got a bit of extra free time. Um, and I can focus more energy on language study and I, I make really good progress. And then maybe work gets a bit busy or something else is happening and the language study is the first thing to stop. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it's trying to find that balance where you're not doing too much, but you're doing something. Yes. You know, because if you're doing too much, that's bad because you can't sustain that. Mm -hmm. You need to find a level where, you know, maybe you're doing 30 minutes, 45 minutes a day and it's sustainable and you're enjoying it. You can't do two hours every day. You can't. It's too it's too much. And maybe you can do it today, but tomorrow you don't want to look at your textbooks, right? But 45 minutes, it's enough to kind of get you started and, you know, maybe, you know, make some some progress. Uh, but tomorrow, yeah, I can do that again, you know, um, maybe do something different, maybe watch a, watch a show or or um, do some reading or whatever. Um, but yeah, finding a, a sustainable rhythm to your language study would be my my top tip. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the English with Colin podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to the conversation and found it helpful in your language learning journey. Remember, the key to mastering a language is regular practice. So make sure you listen to our podcast regularly and keep honing your listening skills. We appreciate your support and feedback. So if you have any comments, questions or suggestions for future topics, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. You can find our contact information in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to joining you again next time for another conversation in English. Until then, keep practicing and take care.